welcome back to episode 25, Dark Night of the Soul, Conscious Feeling, and Breaking Ribs on Toilets. Yeah, a little later on in this episode, uh, we're going to hear from Michael and he's had a little bit of an accident. However, it ties into a topic we had just spoken about, conscious feeling, and how his body has been trying to send him messages. And so we're going to get into that story a little later. Also, if you've listened to episode 23, where Brian told us all that he was going to try to lose weight energetically from mind melting the fat off of him, well, we have a story to tell you all and what actually happened when he tried that one night. But first, we're going to kick things off with the dark night of the soul. We're going to share some of our own personal experiences during our own dark nights of the soul and how we got through them and what we learned on the other side of it. It's a dark journey and oftentimes very painful, but necessary for us to break down all of the false constructs that we've uh, built up around us so that we can build up newer ones that actually stand strong with truth and integrity and love and honor for ourselves. So without further ado, let's jump right into episode 25 and hear what we have to say. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Enlighten Up. I'm here with Lisa and Michael, and you're listening to episode 25. And today we're going to start the show off by talking about the dark night of the soul. We kind of touched on that topic last week with our guest, Michael Philpott. And so we thought it might be great to continue that conversation on a deeper level uh, in this episode so, Lisa, Michael, how are you guys doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing good, too. Oh, yay! yay. <laughs> we have a new Michael today. <laughs> Speaking of dark nights of the soul. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Michael, have you ever heard of the term dark night of the soul before last week? No, actually. Uh, although I feel like we've talked about it without labeling it. Yeah. What do you have any interpretation of what that actually is? Not, no, no. I want to hear you guys first before I, you know, think I know what I'm talking about. Okay, Lisa. You want, you want me to think <laughs> it is? So now it's on you, Lisa. Well, that's fine. Um, I think it to me what it what it is is just it's a time in your life where you feel just a sense of meaninglessness um or depression even like where you just you don't care about anything and you just can't find um joy and happiness in your life just everything feels like a struggle and it can go on for a short time i think or a really long time yeah, it, it definitely can. Um, it's definitely not just one night of darkness, <laughs> uh, no. like the name no. um, uh, implies. But yeah, it's um, it's usually, it can sometimes be, I think, triggered by some sort of traumatic, traumatic event. Um, yeah. Or I think it can also happen when everything that you work for all of a sudden doesn't have the same meaning like for instance when we look at like people these days who are leaving their corporate jobs um for to start their own their own businesses or do something that they're actually really happy doing i feel like that that kind of idea where you you get this high paying job you do you you've gone through all the schooling you get this highly respectful job it's making a lot of money you know you may be having some great societal status Uh, Maybe you've got the, you know, the marriage partner, Um, you're doing all these activities that you believe are supposed to be what life's all about. And then one day you wake up and you realize it's not what you thought it was. And I feel like that's also something that can lead to the dark night of the soul. Basically, it's when everything collapses around you that used to have a certain meaning and no longer has that meaning. Or you, you just, I mean, and I can say from experience that I've I feel like I've experienced that recently 
um, you know, after having a life that was just one way for so long, being married, you know, for 25 years and then getting a divorce and then in that same year quitting my job of 27 years and, you know, just basically having everything turn upside down, having, you know, my kids that I spent so much time with, you know, move out of state and you look around and you're just like turned upside down on your head practically, you know, like you just don't, you feel really, you're just not grounded anymore. Maybe Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. don't know what to hold on to. You really don't know what, where to start, but I think it can also be a time of, of transformation. Oh, absolutely. You know, and I, I think that that's what the great thing about it is that it is a time of transformation and that when you come out on the other side, you come out better than, than you were when you went in. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like the ego dies and the real self emerges. Or at least a piece of the ego. Like maybe you find, yes. you know, you find new meaning in your life or, you know, the things that were important to you, like that you identified with your family, your children, you know, your husband, your children, your job, all those things that are, that you identify with. And then you, or maybe it was, you know, it could have been a divorce or maybe the death of a child or a loss of a job that sparked it. And, and it's devastating, but then you realize once you get through it, that, you know, those things aren't really who you are mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just to find, I think more, more meaning in life. Yeah. So like these, these times of the dark night of the soul, they totally suck when you're going through it. But usually what happens, um, if you, if you can make it through is, um, like you said, Lisa, you emerge transformed, you emerge, um, more whole, I would, I, I would think. And with a little bit more, um, internal happiness as opposed to like, the stuff that's on the outside. And I think that's what happens is we're so taught to build everything up from the outside in. And that's why we all go through these dark nights of the souls because we need, we have to break it all down and then start rebuilding from within so that nothing that we're looking for is outside of us and already built within. Yes, I agree. Yeah. You know, the ego has such a tight grip on us. And when, you know, I think the ego gets a little upset when you start letting go of things that have to do with the ego. Like, you know, maybe these aren't important to me anymore. And, and the ego kicks and screams a little bit and says, you know, no, no, I'm over here. Pay attention to me. These things are important. You know, maybe they're not that important. Yeah. Michael, what about you? <clears throat> I just feel like you guys are just describing what people call rock bottom. <laughs> yeah. Or depression. Yeah, rock bottom or depression or, you know, they almost synonymous with each other in my opinion. Um, well, depending on the depression. But, like, I feel like having what I've felt like I've lived through, uh, you it's almost like you have two choices when you hit rock bottom. You either stay there and die there or you have to figure out and be kind of like reborn. And, you know, that's kind of like the beauty of rock bottom. If you want to look at it, the silver lining of that, um, I mean, that's the way I've obviously feel about myself, especially these past year or so, or uh, I was just feeling much better, much healthier, um, more on track. And uh, but I, I could have easily seen myself also just dwell in that darkness and almost become its friend and continue a long life until I'm done. So, I mean, I'm sure everybody, not, I mean, unless you had a, just like one of the most perfect lives, I'm sure everybody's experienced or have come close to experiencing what they feel like is, was rock bottom in their life. And, you know, I'm sure like a, you know, a therapist or, you know, someone who's ego based is, you know, tell you, you know, it's just depression and, you know, take some Xanax and you'll be fine or Prozac or whatever it is, <laughs> you know, but I think it's, it's actually a, a spiritual thing or, you know, it can be, it's like spiritual detox and a lot of the emotions, like for me, I know I, I, I definitely went through one about, um, eight, 17, 18 years ago and it lasted for three to five years. Um, 
and it was it was really really difficult. But um, for me, I think I've read a little bit about the dark night of the soul, and it kind of gives some examples about how it's like your emotions that you suppress, like maybe if you had traumatic things happen to you when you were a child that you couldn't process those emotions. And then at some point you get in your life where you feel something either triggers it or you feel safe enough to start processing that emotions where everything just starts bubbling up to the surface and you don't understand, like there's nothing maybe going on in your life that would explain why you feel so horrible um, but the reality is, is that you're just processing crap from long ago. And it could even be stuff that you're processing from previous lives that's, you know, in your DNA and that you're letting go. And because of what's going on and all the energies coming into the earth right now, I think that's something that that is happening to people. And maybe they don't understand why why they don't feel good. And I know we've talked a little bit about you know, when you're on this spiritual path, you start thinking you should just start feeling great all the time and you should just feel more joy and be just floating on air and everything should be rainbows and butterflies. And the reality is it can actually trigger the opposite because it's going, you're going to start getting that junk out of you, the dark stuff that you need to shine the light on. You have to, at some point, start to feel and look at, embrace, love and let go. And you can't, you know, you have to go through those feelings and those emotions. Yeah, because those feelings and emotions are embedded in our cellular, in our cells. So in a, on a cellular level, we're carrying all of that. And many times um, stuff that's been passed down to us through our DNA from, um, you know, our parents and their parents and, and, and a, a lot of people don't realize that. And so we're carrying stuff, even when we're born, we're already carrying stuff. And, if we want to let go of those emotions or those old beliefs that are not serving us well anymore, um, beliefs that we've taken on from our parents and, and things like that, society, then we have to let them go. And the only way to let them go is to feel them and so that they can be released. And that's why we have to go through this dark night of the soul. Like there's no way around it. You can't just hope that you know you take a pill and they're all gone in one moment like you have to feel them it's the only way right. yeah i <laughs> my dark night of the soul was almost a decade um wow. yeah it was it was a long one <laughs> uh it definitely had some peaks and valleys but uh mine started when i was 27 and it was triggered by a very traumatic event of finding out that my boyfriend of almost three years, who we were saving up to buy a house together because we were planning on getting married, cheated on me. And um, that just sent me into the downward spiral of my life. And I turned to alcohol. Um, I became very angry and resentful. And so the more I drank, the more that would come out. I was taking it out first on like just random men that I would see in bars. And I was being very, um, very kind of like, I was, I was actually very calculated in what I was doing. I knew exactly what I was doing. I would almost like I would flirt and reel them in only so I could tear them apart. It was, um, when I look back on it now, it's really sad. I feel a lot of sadness in my heart for that person. Like, I'm glad she's healed now. But, you know, it. there was a lot of, um, I my heart was completely destroyed. And all my trust in men was completely destroyed. But it then, it then because I wasn't dealing with it, and I was trying to um, suppress it with alcohol and just late nights out, um, It then turned into me taking it out on my best friends. And I would just, when I was drinking, I would just say really mean, hurtful things for no reason. And that's when I started to get a wake up call is when I realized I was starting to hurt people that I really cared about. And they had, there was no reason to be doing that to them. Um, And and, and that was kind of like my first wake up call. Um, But once I still kind of like started to do some healing, I noticed like there were other things that happened 
Um, I used sex as also um, a suppressant. All of a sudden, I started to not respect myself and not care. And I was just, you know, had sex with strangers and um, just, it just didn't care about myself. And it was just one thing after another that took me down into the deepest hole of um, dishonor, disrespect, and lack of love for self. Uh, and I, and I guess I had to go there in order to get to where I am today. Um, but it was a dark hole to go into and it took years and years and years of work to, um, basically I had to rebuild myself. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty hard. It's, it's a really hard thing to go through, but you learn so much about yourself. And once you learn those things, oh my gosh, life just gets a little bit easier to handle after that. It's kind of like running a marathon, I think. It's like, you know, you have some miles where you feel great, but, you know, it's a long haul and it's it, and it's tiring, you know? <clears throat> I've already described my dark nights to you in the past when it comes to, like, in our podcast. It's like, I don't really, really like want to revisit that, those kind of things. Um, like I said, though, I mean, I, you, you, I, I could have had a different life. I could have continued uh, i mean uh, if i i look i always think i think we all do this in our head it's like we go back in time what things can we change <clears throat> and like i'm like one of the biggest questions i always keep asking myself what i still would want to marry my ex-wife and try to do things differently try to see if we can salvage it and and like i'm wondering if i if like if i push that button would my life be worse or better in the long run and that's the hardest thing to think about because like let's just say i went back and 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 did you know at least on my side and try to figure out and correct everything and but like it never it never got me to force me to really hit that rock bottom ish feeling of, of and learning and trying to be the person that i am today maybe i just continue in, in a comfortable way of life and you know, have that white picket fence and then, you know, eventually kick the bucket. So sometimes it's like, it's, it's hard to say if, and, and this is the hardest thing for me to admit because I hated what I went through and I never wished it upon anybody, but like maybe it was meant to be, you know, that all that kind of feel, feel good stuff. Maybe it was meant to be because maybe I'm going to be a much better person. And I am, uh, in my opinion, a much better person than I was, let's say, 10 years ago. Not that I was an evil person trying to to do bad things, but, you know, I feel like I guess I'll give it a little bit of credit, although I, I just hated going through it. <laughs> yeah, it like, all... it took me seven years to forgive the guy who cheated on me. And when, now when I look back on it, um, I am actually very grateful to him for cheating on me and I, for, for multiple reasons. Um, one, I'm so glad I'm not with him anymore. Um, but more so the more thing that I'm actually really, um, happy about and grateful for is that he basically was my mirror and he, you know, one of the things that I think many people feel when they're cheated on is that they feel like they're not good enough. Um, like someone else, someone needed someone else other than them to satisfy certain needs and, um, that there was something lacking within me that he had to seek it elsewhere. And so th I think this is a very common feeling. And what I realized when I was, um, contemplating the forgiveness or not contemplating, but I, I literally went out and asked to find forgiveness for him after seven years. And I found it because it, it's like my higher self almost showed me that he was just being my mirror and he was simply showing me how I felt about myself. And that was a big eye opener for me because at the time I would have thought that I like totally loved myself and thought that I, you know, everything was great and that I totally knew what I was doing and that, you know, I honored my, I had a completely distorted version of it. And that's when it became apparent that he was simply just showing me how I thought of myself. And that's when I really knew I had to go deep into my, um, my own work. And for that, I'm ever grateful for, because that really was a turning point for me. 
So Can you imagine if we all realized that from the moment that it happened, like when things like that happen in our life, whether it's losing a job or a friend doing something that hurts our feelings or a breakup or something that at that moment we realize that that person is just a mirror, you know, for ourselves. I, 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 I mean, ourselves. but there are things that you can't control. Like if a friend like does something bad to you, how is that a mirror to you? You create your, your life and there's no exceptions. Absolutely. Every, I, but I don't understand the, the word mirror that you're using then. Uh, it's, just showing like if, I, if my friend murdered somebody else, I'm not going to sit there and go, oh, well, that's a reflection. That's a mirror of me. Well, it doesn't you know mean that you're a murderer, but it. I but know. It, that's why I'm confused with the word it mirror. Maybe showing you parts of yourself that you need to look at. Maybe you've had feelings of wanting to murder someone or, you know, it's like you're, you're judging that person, but you have to understand that you can't see anything outside of yourself that you that isn't already within you. I can understand part of this, but not the whole thing. Cause I can so, understand like we go after, like, for example, in relationships, we kind of like pick people that, that, that may not be right for us because we have our own issues and problems. But like, I, I feel like there are just things that, I mean, it's completely out of our hands. It can't be like complete reflection of us. I think, well, it, I think what you're struggling with is that you're taking it too literally I think um, so too, because I'm using the word mirror. <laughs> well, yeah, but there word. are you can there are certain aspects that can be mirrored to you, just not you mirrored on a whole. Okay, like for instance, he was being my mirror for the insufficiency that I was feeling, but there were certain things about him that weren't like had anything to do with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, th- it was that part that I was being that was being mirrored to me. So it's not everything on a whole. There's just other parts. And, and sometimes it's also to teach us lessons of compassion and um, forgiveness. That's a hard one. That's a really hard one to like really move through. So, you know, sometimes it takes a really difficult event to move through um, that, that aspect to really learn what it means to be compassionate or to forgive. You know, the, I think, you know, we've talked about this, Nicole, um, about, you know, the reason that we come into this life and to experience, simply to experience, to experience the good, the bad, you know, the joy, the pain, all of that. And that's the purpose in this 3D body to, we can't experience these things, you know, without a body, these same emotions and everything. And the one thing I'm really trying to wrap my head around lately is how much we judge ourselves constantly. And we have this story running in our head of like who, you know, who we are. And like Michael, you just said, you know, maybe if you, what would have happened if you didn't get married and, you know, the white picket fence and things had to happen for a reason. You know, when we look at it in this very linear (laughs) view, when... By the way, sorry to interrupt, but my least favorite phrase is what people say is like, uh, it's meant to be. I just, it for some reason gets me going like in a bad way. Like, I just don't, I don't know. It's like, that's the hardest thing. I don't want to sit there and go, my life's already been planned out for me. It's meant to be. There's no rainbow, you know, at the end of our life, there's no, you know, golden, um, you know, bucket of golden coins and there's no rainbow there. It's not like we're trying really to achieve anything except, you know, awakening and enlightenment, you know, and, and we put so much, we're all constantly as the ego, we're living in the future or living in the past and playing the story of who we are over and over and over in our heads of what we did and what we didn't do and what we want and always chasing after something or thinking about how the, you know, maybe the past could have been different or why did we do this or, you know, and if we just shut all of that off and, simply experience without judgment what it is that we're experiencing in the now i mean that's where you where you find like true freedom and whether you're having a dark night of the soul or you're having a really happy joyful time in your life neither one should really be different you're here to experience and live in the now now but 
we're always comparing it to things. And I, I don't know. I think that that's where we, you know, we could just be, we could be happy all the time, but we're not because we're constantly judging ourselves. Well, I think it's not even so much that we could be happy all the time, but that we can be okay feeling our sadness or our anger and not judge it as bad and just allow that feeling to come through because I feel like we're here just to experience. And, you know, the human race is the most feeling, was one of the most feeling races there is according to what, you know, I've read upon and that, you know, we do feel so much. And so allowing ourselves to have those feelings without judging it to be bad or good um, I think helps to, A, it helps you move through it faster um, if it's some of the more painful emotions, um, and, and B, just lets it be what it is without it having to be bad or good. And that's where I think it's our, it's our perception of everything that makes it painful or not painful. Correct. I mean, not that, I mean, being depressed is, is not fun. I mean, when you don't care about anything and you don't want to even get out of bed and nothing has any meaning to you, I mean, it's definitely difficult to move through those times. But I think, you know, one of the secrets is embracing it almost like as a friend. I was talking to somebody about this today. Like sometimes I get anxiety in my chest and I really don't always know why. And my chest will just get really tight. My throat will tighten up and I've learned to talk to my anxiety like it's my friend. I'm like, oh, hey, hi, you're back. Like, what are you here to tell me? Like, you know, and what am I supposed to be, you know, what not what am I feeling right now and why did you come? And and it's actually helping it so that it doesn't it doesn't appear. It's like I'm not afraid of it and I'm not pushing against it. I'm just allowing it to happen mm-hmm. and, and embracing it. And I think that during that dark night of the soul, if you can somehow um, look at it in that way, like, okay, this is a, this is a transformation. This is something that I'm moving through. You know, it's not like there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You're, you're going to get to the, to the end of the tunnel. You know, all three of us on this podcast have experienced it and, you know, we made it through without putting a bullet in our head. So that's good. (laughs) (laughs) That's why we have a podcast. (laughs) Yeah, I think that whole like exploratory um, like attitude is really good to have. It's just like look at it like you're exploring. You're exp- you're exploring your anxiety, and when we explore things, it kind of takes a- it puts a different vibration around, like a different energy around it that isn't so um, I don't know, so dreadful or so it takes away the need to know. You know, right. like you're asking why yeah. all the time. Exactly. Like, I've heard that that's not a good thing to do. Like, don't ask yourself why. You could just be like, hey, you know, I wonder. But, but we don't constantly have to be asking ourselves why things are happening. Just experience them. And I guess that's the point I was trying to make about, you know, we're coming to this life and experiencing all sorts of different things and trying try to do that without judging it as being good or bad and just judge it as an experience you know whether it's a you just got a great promotion or you lost your job or you know you just got married or you got divorced you know either way you're ex- you're experiencing that that's life you know we're here to experience it mm-hmm. we all go through this in you know, ups and downs of life so just that's the ride that we're on just enjoy it <laughs> Yeah, and I think like if you're someone who's going through the dark night of the soul right now or you know someone who is, I think it's really important to at least have a couple of people that you can talk to, um, that you can, or you know, express something um, of what's going on inside you. Because I feel like if you don't have anyone, whether it's a friend or maybe it's an anonymous community, I don't know, like you know, but someone that you can open up to so that you can share what's going on, whether it's in your mind or in your life, so that uh, you're able to sort of start working your way through it because repressing it only um, actually makes it even darker. So it's really important to have 
at least one or two people that you can open up to. And um, I feel like usually when we're on the dark night that those people do show up. You know, like we're never left alone if we're willing to just see the help when it presents itself. And sometimes it presents itself in very interesting ways. So, yeah, I think that, I mean, I know for me it can, and I'm much better now than I used to be, but that was something that was really, really hard for me too. And I think anyone with depression or any type of, you know, mental type illness, you know, it's not a physical ailment that you have. It's really hard to admit that, like, and say, you know, I'm just feeling horrible, you know, or I'm depressed, or I just don't care about anything anymore. And um, just, it's just really hard to share that with people and and think that they'll understand, because, you know, some friends aren't the greatest friends to share those things with, you know, they'll tell you, well, how great your life is, and how you should feel fine and all that. And those things don't help us because we just don't feel good, you know, and it's just important. It is important to have somebody that you can reach out to and just admit that you're just not feeling great, you know, and that, that hopefully that that's just okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's a good point. Like I feel like um, sometimes it's just important to have someone listen to you and that's it. Like there doesn't need to be that right thing to say. You know, I think we all struggle with that, especially like around death is like we don't know what to say. And I think more than anything, people just want to know you're there. And I think if you just let that be, whether it's just in your presence of being there or just listening, like I think that's a huge um, help that I think is understated in what that actually does for people. The, the thing that helps me the most I find when I just feel horrible and I just, you know, there's really just no reason is when somebody just chooses just to do something with me, but not talk about why I don't feel good. Like literally just almost kind of ignore the fact that maybe I'm not my usual bubbly smiley self and not ask me like, Oh, are you okay? Are you feeling better? Like, what can I do? And they just say, Hey, you want to watch a movie or you want to get something to eat or Maybe I'll just sit with you, you know, or just allow you just to be who you are. So, you know, if you have a friend that's struggling with that, I think the best thing to do is just sometimes you don't even want to talk about it because there's nothing to talk about. You just feel like shit (laughs) and there's really nothing you want to say about it. Like, I know that's how I am sometimes. I'm like, I have nothing to say. I just feel like at some point this is feelings going to go away and I just don't want anyone to ask me about it. So, yeah, that's definitely it's it's it, that's definitely true. It's, you know, it's a fine dance of knowing like, um, you know, is this something to talk about or do we just allow the person to feel what they're feeling and not have to make it anything other than what it is? But, you know, I think when it's something that is persistent, that it does need a little bit more attention and sometimes um you know, you, you need a friend or someone to kind of just let you know that they're there if you so choose. Yeah, definitely. And if you just choose to open up and talk about it, I, well, for me, I know that's when I would, if I'm not being pushed to talk about something and I'm just given space to be allowed to feel the way I feel, I will automatically open up. Like, you know, when I don't feel a lot of pressure, when I know that that person's like, whenever you're ready, I'm here to talk. You know, if there's anything you ever want to share or say, you know, I'm here. Meanwhile, you know, want to bake some cookies? Cookies always make people feel better. (laughs) Until after you've eaten them. (laughs) They smell so good. (laughs) Simple little things like that. But, you know, that just made me think when, you know, we're talking about just letting people feel the way they feel. I think that's something that we you know, as humans don't allow, you know, from a small age, you know, we cry and we're told not to cry or we're told how we should feel like we should be happy when this happens and we should be sad when that happens. And, you know, we shouldn't get angry or, you know, and we're told so many shoulds about our feelings that we learn at such a young age to actually 
you know, shut our emotions off and we forget what it's like to actually feel. <clears throat> and I think that that's, that's important to just feel whatever it is that you're feeling without judging it. Yeah, it's true. Like we, um, we, it's basically what you're talking about is conscious feeling. And so we disconnect so much from our bodies. That's actually the first thing that we disconnect from is our body. And our body teaches us so much of what's actually going on. There's a lot of uh, hints and signs and messages that our body's trying to communicate to us. But because we shut off this feeling, because we're basically taught that in many ways um, growing up, uh, that we don't get to have that relationship with the body that, you know, one of the things I learned through my Dark Night of the Soul was the importance of basically connecting mind and body together. And I learned that through yoga with the breath. And when I started to use my breath as a connector from the mind and body, I was able to, it was incredible how much insight started to flood my mind about what I was feeling in certain areas of my body and what my mind was telling me in regards to that. And so many things made sense that had plagued me for so long of the things that I'd wondered about or maybe didn't even know I was asking. I wasn't consciously aware that I was asking, but then all of a sudden answers started coming in. And it's because the mind and body are meant to work together and the breath is there to build the bridge. And when we go into like that shallow breathing and we don't, we don't have that conscious breath um, that we've talked about on the show before, that's when we've completely disconnected from feeling and using that as a way to gain our own individual insight. So it's very disempowering um, to, to lose that conscious feeling that you're talking about. Yeah, like a feeling will come up like anger and you know, our immediate thought will be like, oh, I shouldn't be angry. You know, well, no, it's okay to feel anger. You can, you know, let yourself feel it, look at it, try to understand it. You know, don't just sweep it under the rug and forget about it because then, you know, that's like you're going to end up with a dark night of soul one day because all those emotions are going to have to at some point come out. You have to feel what you feel. Yeah. Mike, you have any thoughts on this? Not, I mean, I completely get what you guys are saying, <clears throat> but I mean, I just, unfortunately, I just don't have much more input. I feel like I've talked too much about my, my stuff in the past and like, and, and I know you guys have gone through stuff too. It's like, I'm just wondering, can you actually, um, I mean, dark nights of the soul could happen a couple of times in your lifetime. Like maybe you lost focus uh, from the first dark night. So it could happen again. Oh yeah. Uh, no, I yeah. totally think you could have multiple ones. Cause like I just, mine was just a divorce. I didn't lose my job. My parents didn't like, you know, die. My brothers and sisters didn't die. My family didn't die. You know, like I could just <laughs> see somebody else's dark night being way darker than mine. Divorce is right up there with the death of a loved one. I know. And I understand that. But like, I've, you know, like, like, um, uh, we know people that lose, well, even what Michael was saying last week, um, when he was like going, I lost my job, my girlfriend dumped me. I mean, it sounded like a country song. And <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, in relative terms, it, I felt like I went through a really bad pain, but I remember reminding myself, I don't have it as bad as some other people. I'm not sure if that's a good thing to remind yourself when you are in that state and trying to get out of it or not. But then again, I'm so worried that I could be something to happen again in my future where I could go back into a state like that. So like it could happen a couple of times in your lifetime, even though you can, you can be, you can sit there and say words like I'm going to be strong. I'm not going to judge. I'm not, I'm going to go with the flow, but there is only so much certain like things you can handle without like all of a sudden like the dam breaking in a way. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, like, uh, like, for instance, like what happened to me this summer, you know, like with all of that deception, like it did it did send me into like a weird place and it took me a little while to get through it. But because of the growth and the evolution that had happened through that first like dark night of the soul, like that like eight, nine years, 
I had more tools and understanding of myself and what was actually happening. And instead of like really looking outside of myself, I was working on just building more within me. And so as we go through it, we're strengthening ourselves. So we'll never be as weak, weakly built as we were from the very beginning. So yes, there's always going to be things that are going to present themselves, whether they're hardships or uh, emotionally traumatic events or anything like that, that kind of take us by surprise and we're not maybe prepared for them in whatever's going on in our life. But I feel that as we evolve, we do equip our, if you're learning, if you're actually trying to, to grow, then you are building your toolbox and you're adding more tools in there and you're learning how to use them efficiently so that when you do meet these problems, they're not going to take you down as hard as they would prior to that. I completely agree. I, I think the same thing happened to me where I, you know, I had this long, what I felt like it was long, like almost five years. And I, ne- you know, there were times I, you know, wanted to go on like an antidepressant and I, and I never did. I never let myself and not that I'm saying that nobody should ever go on one, you know, but if you learn to actually get through it yourself and face your demons and face that, you know, those emotions that are coming up and work through them. Then when it comes up again, which, you know, it has for me, you know, after I got a divorce, I obviously, you know, had some some stuff come up, but I felt like I was able to get through it a lot more quickly because I had already done this before. I'm like, you know what? I've done this before. I know what I need to do. I know the kind of space I need to get my head in and the kind of thoughts I need to stay away from. And I know that I need to stay active and, you know, just eating right and drink less and just all the things that I know are going to help me because I've got to get out of this. You know, I don't want to do this again for that long. And you definitely do learn. Yeah. If, if If you truly work through it, you don't just suppress it. I mean, some people just, you know, don't really ever work through their shit. I don't think, you know, they use drugs and alcohol and sex and things to just to try to keep suppressing it. And I think the secret is don't do that. You know, you've got to just, you've got to look at it face on. You've got to shine the light on it. You've got to talk about it. You've got to admit to it. You've got to just feel it. Well, I wouldn't go so far as say don't do it because it might be just the thing that, you know, like it may, you may have to hit rock bottom before you actually like wake up. Um, I mean, we'd like to all think that it doesn't have to get to the worst part, but you know, all our paths are there for a reason. Um, and whatever lessons are there that, you know, you signed up for, maybe that's part of it. But the sooner that we can become aware of it and that it's not exactly, um, making it easier on us, then that's what it yeah, it's not it easier. Like, Michael, wouldn't you say that you, that, you know, given what you've gone through, that you have a little bit more wisdom and tools that you're equipped with to handle things going forward and to say, like, your next relationship? Yeah, yeah, but I'm still damaged from it. (laughs) I was telling Lisa about it the other night. Like, I still recognize the, my current limitations in, in in life and but like just know I mean and Lisa said this and I kind of knew it too but just knowing knowing the damage knowing things that I need to work on personally um, is a big part of just knowing how to deal with it and you know I this podcast and you guys have been a, a great help because it really makes me look at myself almost outside of my body like like who are you as a person who are you on the inside not just the outside and so I feel like I'm on the right track but I still still have some more work I need to do we all do (laughs) yeah you know me I'm just I'm perfect now (laughs) Lisa's perfect in making cookies for everyone (laughs) I'll make you all cookies I'm perfect no we all have work to do right you know just when I think I've okay I've got I remember before I had I call it my nervous breakdown which was my dark night of the soul before I had that I swear I remember driving down the road and you know 
I've always been a spiritual person and I'm like talking to God on the way to work. And I remember actually thinking, well, you know, things are good. Like, I just, I don't know. I just don't feel like I have really anything I need to like be really working on right now. <laughs> <laughs> And I and that, and that's the thing was like when you start saying that, then you're going to get you feel almost too cocky and something's going to happen. I actually have tingles in my head right now. I think my my higher self is laughing at me because they're like, yeah, we remember that day. And then a rock came out of the sky and just landed on my fucking head. And I was like, wow, was I wrong? You know, so sometimes when you're just feeling your best, maybe that's why. You know, I was able to process all those emotions that suddenly came up because I was feeling good and I was feeling secure and stable and, you know, and, and maybe in a safe enough environment to where I felt like I could handle it. So from what I understand, that's that's kind of something that that happens psychologically. You know, if, if things have happened to you in the past, especially in your childhood, that you weren't able to process that when you're an adult, you'll feel those things. Maybe something might trigger it, but it also might be something just as you're feeling secure in your life and you know that you're emotionally um, equipped to handle going through it. Like God will only give you what you can handle sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I do believe so that. Like, I know I've never arrived. I've come to the conclusion I have never arrived. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I'm just not ever gonna say that kind of stuff anymore <laughs> <laughs> well it's almost like you were like dancing with um what's it called it was like you were dancing with the ego a little bit you know like i got this you know and uh almost <laughs> like okay let's see how much you got this but i was like wow was i wrong yeah but you weren't wrong because you did have it <laughs> for a minute <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's funny, this, this, is, this is just something that actually happened, but around that same time, and I don't remember if it was that, that same day that I was having those thoughts or whatever, but I remember this being around this time, again, I was driving to work and, you know, feeling great about my life in general, everything felt like it was going well, and all of a sudden, I felt like my car was full of people, like, you know that? You know, if you were in your car and there was a bunch of people in your car and even if nobody was making any noise and you shut your eyes, you would feel, you could tell there were people in your car just from the energy and the presence. And I just felt this presence of all of these people in my car. And I was thinking, wow, that's just, that's just really weird. Like, who are all these people in here? And it was literally within days that I had this dark night of the soul kind of drop on my head and and I think back to that day and I feel like it was um, like my spirit guides and my higher self letting me know that you're about to hit a wall, but we're all here. Oh, my God, Lisa, you're so right. The same thing happened to me. Um, it's, it's funny you say that because that does make me think that there is some preparation that we may not realize starts to happen before everything really falls apart because right. – I knew that my relationship with this guy, I wasn't happy with it. Uh, I knew that I wasn't being treated the way I should have been treated or wanted to be treated. And I felt like I was very low on the priority list. And so he did something uh, where he he had to leave the country for a couple weeks and basically was a total dick to me right before he left. And so it's almost like that fueled my... It just fueled something within me to like get myself back because I had really disempowered myself throughout that relationship. And I remember going into a bookstore and I was standing in front of a, I just was standing in front of the bookshelf and I'm like, I don't know why I'm standing here, but I just know there's a book here that I'm supposed to read. And all of a sudden I, my hand just went and grabbed a book off the, 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 the shelf because that's just. You know, when something is, this is how I choose my books. It just pops out at me. And it said, excuse me, your life is waiting. And I just knew that I was supposed to buy that. And I went and read it. And I started to, 
work more on creating the life I wanted for me. Whereas in this relationship, I was depending more on him to make me happy. Uh, You know, I mean, I was 25 at the time, 26. And so, you know, I was looking outside of myself for all my happiness. And I think this was the first book that really showed me how to create what I wanted and manifest things. And that's when I started to really understand how powerful my manifestation skills were because shortly after, well, even during reading that book is when I would think about things that I wanted and they'd all of a sudden appear to me. They'd all appear like I'd be getting them for free. People would be giving them to me. And in that mo- like about a month before we broke up, when I found out that he cheated on me, um, and this was only a couple weeks after buying this book, I started envisioning um, I started envisioning a condo that I wanted to buy for myself and I wanted to have my own property. I wanted to buy my own property. And I would go out to bed every night and start focusing on what I wanted. And I think that in doing that, I was starting to build up my strength to take care of myself before everything basically hit the fan. And four months after we broke up, somehow being $30,000 in debt and no savings, I managed to save up enough money in six weeks to put a down payment on a condo. I don't know how it happened. It was like the grace of God. I just got really busy at work all of a sudden. I was able to save it and I got the condo that I had been wanting and I didn't know how I was able to do it because, you know, I was self-employed. My tax paper showed I made nothing because I wrote everything off and somehow everything conspired to make it work for me. And that's when I started to realize that, oh, when I actually start doing things for myself and and building up from within, that's when life started to support me. And I think that was one of the saving graces I had going into that because everything else was shit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a that's a, actually a really good point that you brought up. Yeah, that you are being prepared and you don't even know it. Yeah. Like things about to to turn that, you know, you are being prepared. Definitely. Your angels are always out there. They're watching out after you, even if you don't believe in them. Yeah. <laughs> How's things uh, going for with you, Michael, in your meditations or anything like that? Raising your mm-hmm. vibrations? I can't really do my breathing exercise. I I think I broke a rib on Friday, so it's like it's painful to breathe. But other than that, you know, it's been so busy traveling that, like, i just making up excuses, but I just haven't had time to, like, even, like, try to, like, calm down and take some minutes for myself. How did you break a rib? I don't know. Because I'm a clumsy ass. So it's like, like I went running today. To, because I go crazy if I don't run. And after an amount and a half, I had to like stop because it's way too painful. And um, it's just, uh, it's not much I can do. I gotta wait for like five, six weeks for it to heal. Um, but. Was it a fun I, thing that broke your rib? Like rough sex or. <laughs> <laughs> you been good? No. No, it was, I slipped in the bathtub like an old man and fell back and hit the toilet seat with my ribs. Oh, <laughs> no. Were you drunk? Of course not. I don't drink, hardly. Okay. <laughs> you were drunk in the bathtub. I, I plead the fifth or sixth or whatever I need to plead on that one. Uh, we got the picture, we got the picture. Yeah, well... I would have, with the rough sex, I would have said, yeah, she was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately, it wasn't that cool of a story for you. <laughs> Ow, and it hurts a lot. I'm oh, trying not to laugh too much. Oh, my goodness. Interesting. Interesting that a rip broke. Uh, yeah, that's what? wild to heal. Because the rip. No, I feel like Nicole has some sort of witch doctor thing about it. No. She's going to look. She's going to look it up. It's, it's like the Lewis right, Hayes. It means like, I, you know, I promise something. you, I promise you, I'm not looking it up. I just think it's Spiritual interesting um, because the ribs are what protects everything. And I just find it interesting that your body has a broken rib. 
Well, it protected my inside and my organs from a toilet seat, so you're right there. <laughs> Protecting you from the shit. <laughs> exactly. Um, but no, I haven't. I, I I have and I haven't had time. But like, I I don't really like. I don't like to call it meditation for some reason. I don't think it's meditating when I what I do. Um, you know, I, but like, I don't really know what I'm doing. Sometimes I feel like I'm just driving blind. Uh, and so when I do try to work on that side, you know, sometimes it helps, and sometimes I just feel like I just wasted my time so it's it's still a work in progress <clears throat> well i think a lot of what happens when we meditate doesn't necessarily happen while we're meditating you know we we allow just that space to open up in our mind and then that's when you know ideas may become come to you just you know when you're in the shower or you know, something like that. But I don't necessarily think you have to have some crazy experience or vision while you're meditating. Well, a vision of me falling in the shower sure as heck didn't come in the shower. It came to truth, <laughs> fruition. <laughs> well, it's like, uh, a, it's like a work in progress, like you said, you know, and, and the more yeah, you... Yeah, I haven't given up hope, though. Yeah. I don't want you guys to think that. And, and you know what, M Michael... I've struggled with my meditations this year. I went through a few months where I was just like, wow, I don't feel like I'm doing anything. And so I think that's something that happens even when we're really well versed in what some people would imagine someone to be well versed in the realm of meditation. Um, so I think it's sometimes we have blocks and it's preventing certain things from opening up. And that might just be the thing for you. It certainly was for me throughout the summer. Um, so... And even, even still to this day, like I'm still having some, uh, it's basically, well, I'm not at the level that I was say before the summer. So, but then again, maybe there's other things that I'm supposed to be paying attention to. Okay. I'm going to read to you from the internet. <laughs> Rips and Corso. Dr. Spirit. One's personal boundaries. We each occupy personal space in life. Some need more, some less of it. But anytime we are being either invaded or having our space taken away from us, we may experience a sympathetic response in the form of an injury, pain, or other distress to the rib cage and surrounding muscles. The holistic recommendation is that you try to identify how or whether your personal space is being altered by circumstances you cannot control and find ways to adapt to it if you cannot keep it from happening. In any case... Setting workable boundaries for your own territorial needs is the real issue. Oh my God. How's that sound? Michael. I don't feel like that talks to me at all. So We, we just talked about that before we started this call. What are you talking about? My personal boundaries? Yes. Yeah, not following you on that one. Oh my God. How you don't have time for yourself. How you, do, you, you have no. All of that. Yeah, okay. So be it. You got me there. <laughs> Time for yourself, um, personal boundaries. Yeah, making those boundaries for yourself. And... Oh, I, I, yeah, I missed that when she was reading. I missed the time for yourself one. Oh, uh, you well, see? Uh, awareness. Awareness is so key on the spiritual journey. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you guys, it's like, I feel like when you say these things and read these things, I feel like uh, we always used to, you know, try to guess guess your horoscope by reading three horoscopes and every horoscope sounded like it was your horoscope because it just became so broad and general. Like, I don't know about these, about these kind of things. Okay. But, uh, here's, here's the reality of it though, Michael. <clears throat> I felt the need to tell you that I thought it was interesting that your rib broke at this particular <laughs> time in your life. There was a reason why I was prompted to say that. Lisa felt the need to go deeper and actually look it all up. All right, all right. I see where this is going. <laughs> Word game of yours. And for all our listeners, yes, this is how you can do your own little uh, detective work on what's going on. Yeah, get, is get, get two crazy girls to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I went to in 5D. Oh, my gosh. But, you know, like this is OK. I was just talking about how our body is trying to talk to us. Right. This is I it could really have sent a text message, not this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't get me started on the text message. You may have been late to that response too. <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, so there's that's kind of actually really interesting. I love how that just kind of happened. Synchronicities happening in the moment. Glad to, glad to help you guys out, Dan. <laughs> well, um, I don't know, Lisa. You probably feel the same way I do about that. About synchronicities? Yeah, about his rib and what's going on. And oh, yeah, I think it's spot on. Yeah, but he reminded me of he reminded me of Brian when you started bringing up the you know when did you gain weight and. He just kept saying, I just don't make the connection. I'm not making the connection. <laughs> you know. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So, Did you tell the audience what happened to Brian the day after um, that podcast? No, I didn't. But he, okay, so he, on that podcast, he said he would try to mentally envision his his um, extra fat melting away and so he said when he went to bed that night, he, he always takes him a long time to fall asleep. So he goes, so I just kept envisioning, you know, like the cells and all this stuff. And he goes, and I just fell asleep envisioning that. And he got up the next morning, he did his normal thing and he got on the scale and he pretty much weighs himself every day, works out and then weighs himself. And he had lost five pounds and he comes running downstairs like, I just can't even believe it. There's no other explanation that, I mean, there's just no other explanation because he didn't, you know, eat any differently the day before he didn't, his workout wasn't any different. And he's just like, it just makes, I mean, I can see maybe a pound or two, but five, almost five and a half pounds. He was convinced. Yeah. So, so for all our listeners, if you haven't listened to episode 23 yet with Jeremy McDonald, we talked about you know, energetically losing weight. And that's what Brian did. He tried to visualize himself burning the fat away and building muscle or whatever it was that he was doing. And I don't know, like, that's what happened. So, yeah. Yeah. He might have to do that when he gets back. He's been in China for two weeks and he said all they do is eat. It's like a cultural (laughs) thing. Eat, 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 eat. Awesome. Well, I'm very happy that he's coming home soon. And um, yeah, so I don't know. Anything else you guys wanted to bring up before we uh, wrap this baby up? Nope. But I recommend if you have an injury, you know, something going on with your your body that, you know, try looking it up. See what it's kind of like dream interpretation, you know. If you get something out of it, great. If you don't, that's fine. But, you know, you can look things up and this in 5D has a great, and I know Louise Hayes does it as well. Just talks about, you know, if there's a specific area that's bothering you, what it might be trying to indicate to you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really great. And uh, there's a lot of, I mean, understanding the body and how it's speaking to you is gone, goes way back into like Chinese medicine, like the holistic, and, um, like Eastern philosophy with um, medicine t- is completely um, based on all of that. So there's different ways that there's a lot of information out there basically that you can look into as to what might be going on within your body that are the messages that are trying to point out to you what you should be looking at on a deeper level. Uh, so... That's really good. And oh, just speaking of meditation, since we were talking about having difficulty meditating and all that, uh, I just released my guided meditation on my website, inflexibleme.com. So if any of our listeners want to, it's a really short, it's only 15 minutes. And um, it's basically to build up your own protection um, and also just bring you actually into more awareness of conscious feeling within your body and feeling your own cells vibrating. Um, My mom tried it and she actually never meditated before in her life. She knows nothing about meditation or really even, you know, this whole journey. Uh, But she wanted to try it because her daughter did it. And uh, she told me that she felt her hands and feet vibrating. So if my mom can experience something like that anyone can experience something like that so for anyone who just fyi truth be told i really i really liked your meditation oh thanks several times i really like it now i can do it without you 
<laughs> good, good. That's I, the plan. Sick. I really like the music, but if I don't have time or want to put that on or whatever, I can just visualize, it, you know, you taking me through it. I really liked it. Yeah. And that's like the perfect thing is like once you can do it on your own and you don't need that, then that's great. So it's just like a tool for anyone who's not used to meditating or not really sure what to do um, or, you you know, that's that's kind of out there. And so um, it's available available for download on my website. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Um, so, yeah, so that's it. So um, good chat on Dark Night of the Soul. I feel like um, it's something that everyone goes through. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here on Earth. Um, the whole point of being here on earth is not to <laughs> not experience anything. So, um, yeah, hope, hopefully that helps people. And I hope your rib heals, Michael. Mm-hmm. Help you get your, your boundaries set. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'll be fine. All right. So thanks for joining us. And, uh, if you guys have any show topics that you want to, uh, ask us to talk about please send them into our email at info at enlighten up dot us or you can tweet them to us at enlighten up us on twitter and um, that's about it so thanks for being on the show and thank you to all of you who are referring us to your friends family co-workers anyone who you think might enjoy the show or get something out of it we appreciate it and uh we're happy to to be here with all of you so until next time we'll talk to you later Bye, everyone. See ya. Bye. Bye.